Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon, will from the 22nd to the 24th of March be transformed to the capital of Mines when it plays host to the fourth edition of the International Convention of Mines and Exhibition. Con men and scammers threatening to take youngsters in Cameroon hostage, displaying ill-gotten wealth and passing around as role models in mafia and feminism. Friends and colleagues of the departed Professor Emeritus Joseph Owona paid their last respects to the fallen legal luminary and statesman in a double tribute event in Yaoundé today as he begins his journey to eternity. Those are the top stories of this edition. Hi everyone and thanks for joining us on the 730 News. I am Ben Menopufung in Yaoundé. And it is, it has become, uh, it has been announced rather that Yaoundé will from the 4th to the 22nd, from the 22nd to the 24th of March be hosting the 4th edition of the Cameroon International Convention of Mines exhibition. The announcement was made at, at a press briefing in Yaoundé today by the Acting Minister of Mines, Industries and Technological Development, Full Callistus Jaitri, as he addressed pressmen in the nation's capital. The International Mines Exhibition will be holding concomitantly with the meeting of the organizing committee of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. Details in this report with Joyce Kimbi for Waju. Beyond the press briefing, it was an opportunity for Professor Fukalistus Gentry to underline Cameroon's transition from a potential mining country to a mining producing country. The theme chosen for this fourth edition of CIMEC is entitled Transition from Geological Potential to Mining and Production as a Means of Strengthening Economic Growth in the Subregion. It also gave the chance for Cameroon to highlight its balanced mining code. The Ministry of Mines is protecting the interests of this nation, whether it comes to what has to be done to the local populations through royalties, through uh, social projects and the rest. I think we can say that we are taking the lead in Africa. The three northern regions, northwest and southwest regions, will benefit from particular attention due to the security context, the airborne geophysical surveys intended to reveal their mining and geological potential had not yet been carried out. As for the session of the Council of Mines Ministers of the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States, it will allow these states to speak with one voice. For short, in under three months, that is from May 22nd to May 24th, Cameroon will take back its position as a mining hub of Africa. This for the socioeconomic benefits of its population. It may not have been evident to you, but palm oil constitutes one of those commodities whose uh, speculative commodities, that is, whose continuous importation is weighing down on Cameroon's trade balance. And you say, Clarice Arway Takang, that unless and until the influx of palm oil into the country is scaled down to competitively acceptable level, the country's economic uh, trade balance will continue to bear the brunt. From the production of refined vegetable oils to soap used in households, palm oil remains the main raw material cherished by manufacturers. However, sourcing challenges continue widening the gap between supply and demand in Cameroon, a deficit which is attributed to a number of factors. The challenges in the sector rose because the farms are old. The 170,000 hectares that we surveyed are no longer as productive, and the crisis in a major production zone also affected the output. The local palm oil industry has been recruiting more entrepreneurs in the last few years. This has created a setup where raw materials sourced from Cameroonian oil palm plantations is not enough to go around. Iran has done a lot of work. For the past 40 years, they have been able to come up with the third cycle planting material, which yields from more than four tons of oil per hectare per year. So we recommend that the seed production unit for oil palm seeds about the bamba should be decentralized. 
oil seed refiners have been requesting for authorizations to import more palm oil as their needs rise, putting pressure on the performance of homegrown varieties. To redress the trend, we want to get more private sector involvement and decentralized bodies. Moreover, if the different actors are regrouped into interprofessions, there will be an increase in palm nuts. Palm oil is amongst the sectors having an impact on the trade deficit between 44% and 71% in the past 10 years. Government action is expected to intensify in order to reverse the trend, keeping the scales between imports and exports more balanced for the economy. And the newly constructed border market on the Cameroon-Nigeria border in the locality of Banki in the far north region has been open for business. The gates of the new market were flung open officially today by a joint Cameroon-Nigeria delegation led by Bono State Governor Baba Ghana Umara Zulum on the Nigerian side and Far North Governor Mijiawa Bakari on the Cameroonian side. Special Envoy Ayuk John Ashu reports from Banki. The reconstruction of the Limani Bridge by the Cameroon government linking Kolofata and Mora subdivisions in Mayosava division to Bama local government area in Bono state of Nigeria has once again relaunched trade between the two countries after the slum caused by Boko Haram insurgency. The common stance by the two countries to improve on the livelihoods of the impacted communities was reiterated by the Far North Governor during the reopening of the Bank International Markets. And Borno State shared certain common precautions so that we can, as one, the church as years, consolidate peace and foster sustainable development. Meanwhile, his colleague of Borno State gave a vote of thanks to President Paul Bia. The reopening of the cattle market is another important aspect that will require the cooperation and collaboration of our two governments. Let me use this opportunity for men. The remodeled Banki market and the would be Banki International Cattle Market have been tipped to speed up the reconstruction and development of communities affected by security challenges along the common borders. I was telling you in the headlines, a cross-section of youngsters in Cameroon is fast falling prey to the trappings of fraudsters and con men whose activities and interactions have as common denominator deception and the use of dirty tricks, rogues and pseudo-moguls who arrogantly pose as role models for their peers but whose social capital is defined by widespread scam and forgery. Phony models who are becoming trendy among their gullible and vulnerable peers, most of whom are already being swayed into the shady enterprise and con men of con men and scammers. And you say, right now to Sally, that such misexamples operating in the glare of the sunshine ought to be named and shamed by their peers rather than wrongly posing as models of success. The business of being fake with the intent to mislead sells like hotcake these days. From shady businessmen to social media influencers who lure youths who look up to them into indecency, this vice is eating deep into society. For any society, when people make progress, there's always that factor of some other people trying to dupe people and all of that because they see the tools as a loophole to perpetrate, I don't know if I'll call it evil or malice. In search of the easy way out of joblessness, most young people fall into the dragnet of the so-called role models who push them into unscrupulous activities. When they, they are not employed, they are exposed because they want to have a better condition of life. They are exposed to everybody that can give them this social condition. And that's why they are, this phenomenon of famine is very increasing in our society. When the desire to make easy cash set in, sexual deviancies and scamming become the order of the day. Somebody goes online and creates a content. If the plan is to hurt, believe me, you will be open to all his uh, acts and plans. But how then can they be shielded from these manipulations? 
you have to select which person is helping you uh, with the content they are creating parents state everybody we can we must work on what our youth are going to do tomorrow knocking on the right door for advice and choosing what content to assimilate will save them from going down the wrong path experts opine as all that glitters isn't gold most of these scam businesses are on a roller coaster ride, hitting and running, making quick money and quick gains. But for how long? And experts are clear on the issue. Wealth comes through hard work, perseverance, planning and self-discipline. Ewane Epole went sampling expert views on the trappings of the get-rich-at-all-cost syndrome and came away with the caution for youths that to be wealthy, don't get trapped in trappings. The sometimes unbridled quest for financial gains by both the young and old in society has pushed a good number of them into money traps, anthropologists say. You have to know that the compensation of uh, salary is uh, labor. Every mechanism you mobilize out of uh, labor can be considered as a money, money trap. For example, we have uh, witchcraft, we have uh, prostitution, we have uh, gambling, and we have uh, cults. Riches are good, no doubt, but not at all cost at least. For sociologists, owing to the fact that man is almost tempted in areas of his or her desires, many are seen madly rushing to place their hard-earned income and their lives into something against promises of whooping returns. Youth nowadays are more attracted of material things. They don't want to work before getting a salary. Because of uh, poverty and also because of the loss of uh, religious uh, value. Fortunately, they say awareness is among the many steps in avoiding getting involved in money traps. Pastors, priests have to put more emphasis on religious educations even at school the background is the education at home the thing is to disgrace those people who are involved in money tracks by refusing uh, their money by refusing their gifts coming from those type of money anthropologists and sociologists suggest that successfully managing our limited financial resources is a matter of doing the right thing and the need for a paradigm shift thus becomes crucial. And this is where the talk of moral rearmament for youths finds all its essence. Cynthia Saptala accosted some of them to gauge the extent of the lure or temptation their get-rich-quick peers are exerting on them and came away with the, with the rather intriguing takes, as you will gather from Cynthia's report. The main idea behind a moral rearmament is that youths themselves seek the change. In a conversation with some young people in the capital city, most say the best way to go about it is through dialogue. You talk to them. Then there are some parents who are always occupied, always around. So it leads some children to, to derail. So we talk to them, we like the children they are, because they are still children, even if they do the bad things they do and they need to be brought closer, spoken to. If you want to impose, the thing is going to be very difficult because we see things in a different way because we think that we are already big. Often tempted to derail into online theft, drugs and excessive alcohol consumption, some youths feel that occupying their idle time could be the solution. I think when employments are available for the youth, they are going to concentrate less on their phones. If we could accompany them towards job creation, it would be good. It's important to show them that we have so much, so much potential. Others suggest that the concept of moral rearmament be taken to schools. By taking moral rearmament to primary and secondary schools as a lesson, they are easily followed up on the right path. We need more centers in order to help these youths face the challenges and start a new life. Ideas that could help to reshape the way of thinking for most youth in order to become productive individuals in today's society. 
and all of these vices are thriving at a time when the head of state has been cautioning youths in Cameroon to beware of social vices such as alcoholism, drug abuse, as well as drug addiction, and a host of others. Let's now take a listen to the head of state caution to the youths on the eve of the Youth Day celebrations this year as he addresses these issues, the one after the other. Moral decay, irresponsible and deviant behavior, violence, indiscipline, alcohol and drug abuse and intolerance are on the rise in our society. Schools are and no exception. Social media, now the preferred means of expression for young people, is being abused and is becoming the stage of various forms of extremism. Once again, I urge you to be fully aware of this situation. I also encourage parents and more generally all educators to fully assume their responsibility. You're watching the 7.30 News on the Cameroon Radio Television, the CRTV. We are beaming live from Yaoundé. The conveyance of the mortal remains of the late Professor Joseph Owona to his final resting place in his native Mvenga in the south of Cameroon has begun in the nation's capital. After the solemn coffining at the morgue of the Yaoundi General Hospital, Earlier today, the Professor Emeritus was treated to a series of tribute events, the one judicial at the Constitutional Council, a member of which he was, and the other academic at the University of Yaoundé II, where he molded multitudes as an erudite constitutional law. Professor Quinta Rita Edang witnessed those events for the 7.30 News. A dark Thursday at the Constitutional Council as members of the legal structure paid judicial honours to the late Professor Joseph Owona, member of the Council who died in France last January 6th. Paying tribute to the fallen constitutional law expert in the presence of a host of dignitaries at the Yaoundé Conference Centre, the President, Clément Atana, said he was an emblematic figure who contributed to enhance Cameroon's judiciary sector. This was closely followed by academic honors, with different speakers referring to him as a nation builder who taught thousands of law students in Cameroon and abroad. A majority of the university dons, who were his past students, said they were consoled by his rich academic writings that will continue to inspire future generations. The honors came on the heels of a coffining ceremony at the Yaoundé General Hospital, where the retired Bishop of Mbalmayo, his Lordship Adaben Zana exhorted Christians to follow the teachings of Christ. The covenant ceremony took place in the presence of the Head of State's representative, Minister of State, Minister of Higher Education, Jacques Famandungu. The day ended with a requiem mass at the Mary Queen of the Apostles Basilica in Voli, officiated by His Lordship Christophe Zwa, Bishop of San Melima, with the Head of State's personal representative, Minister of State, Minister of Higher Education, the Prime Minister, Joseph Dion Gute, and other top government officials, the 79-year-old Professor Joseph Owona, who studied law in some of the best French universities, served as member of government in different ministries. He will be laid to rest in his native village of Mvenge this Saturday. And as you heard in Quinter's report, Professor Joseph Owona touched several lives, both in his capacity as varsity don and as member of government and the Constitutional Council. His peers, colleagues, former students and friends described him as an astute politician and a rare gem in the Cameroonian intelligentsia. Emmanuela Vermeu captures those testimonies in the following report. He touched lives, impacted society, and leaves behind a huge legacy. And to manifest his worth, these multitude of mourners are here to pay Professor Jose Wona their last respect. I remember him as a brilliant intellectual who combined 
intellectual elegance and eloquence with a lot of gravitas. We have lost an eminent personality. As my boss, when he was um, Secretary General, he is someone for whom I had a lot of respect. He was a great statesman and who knew what it meant to compromise. The late statesman was amongst the first Cameroonians to be certified in public law and political science and spent over 40 years of his lifetime transmitting this knowledge to many in universities across Africa and the world. When he got to France to prepare for his aggregation, it was an event. He is an irreplaceable erudite. In public law in Africa, we owe him a lot. An architect of the 1996 Constitution of Cameroon, having led the 11-man technical committee in charge of its drafting, the one-time Minister of Youth and Sports, Health and Education is on his journey to eternity. He was a great friend since I arrived in Cameroon. His kindness towards me and the nationalism spirit he projected. Memories the mourners hope to hold dear in remembrance of the one who worked tirelessly for the growth of his fatherland, Cameroon. On to something else now. The Japanese government has donated a significant stock of technological equipment to help remove carbon dioxide from the belly of the Lake Munun in the west region of the country. The equipment that comprises, amongst others, of a deep water removal system and its accessories was handed over to the coordinator of the operational and management unit of the Lake Munun project in the presence of the his counterpart of the Japan International Cooperation Agency in Cameroon. From Bafusam, Shivan Boguma reports. Statistics from the monitoring mission in 2016 reveal that Lake Monun receives 370 tons of carbon dioxide per year. The current disposal system has an annual capacity of 145 tons, hence the need for an additional system to prevent any tragedy. The Cameroon government and its partners should uh, secure Lake Munun because the quantity of carbon dioxide that is entering the lake is about 8.4 megamole per year. And the one solar power degassing system that is in the lake now is removing just 3.3 megamole per year. So to balance the recharge and the discharge, we needed two more deep water removal systems. The benefits of the donation from the Japanese government through JICA goes far beyond safety. Other pending issues to be addressed include the rehabilitation of related infrastructure, notably the alarm station, climatic station, and the observatory buildings. Tourism and Leisure Minister Belo Buba Maigari has been transmitting the message of compassion and solidarity of his ministry and the government to the family and victims of last week's explosion at a hotel management training center in Douala that left scores of trainees injured. Minister of State Belo Buba Maigari gave the health personnel a pat on the back for their professionalism and promptitude in handling the victims. Here is Rabia Tunjengi Abudlaziz from Douala. The Minister of State, Bello Buba Maigari, first met with family members of the victims and owners of the institute to have more information about the fire incident. During discussions, the president of the institute disclosed that two amongst the 18 students burned have lost their lives, while seven are still under intensive care at the Douala Referral Hospital. The minister then used the occasion to extend a message of condolence to the bereaved family present. His next stop was at the Douala Referral Hospital where he went to see for himself the state of the seven students still under intensive medical care and those coming for daily dressing of their wounds. It was an obligation for me as the Minister of Tourism to come and see by myself. We should congratulate the personnel of the hospital and wish 
the quickest recovery to all those who still remain. He was accompanied throughout his stay in Douala by the Secretary General at the Littoral Governor's Office, Abu Bakari Haman Chioto. We're sorry for the abrupt end of that report there. The Garoa Public Works Vocational Training Center now has a new bus. Panga Noe Herman took up command at the helm of the institution with a call from the presiding secretary of state at the Ministry of Public Works to put a special eye on the implementation of innovative modules that will render trainees immediately operational upon graduation from the center. Tanjong Levis Agbo reports from Garua. Since its creation, the Garua Public Works Vocational Training Center has adopted innovative professional disciplines. The new director in charge of the institution was installed with a call to continue working and improving training in the center. During the installation ceremony in Garua, the Secretary of State to the Ministry of Public Works emphasized the need to ensure quality vocational training of public works technicians. We should work so that uh, uh, this center should improve in the way of, uh, of uh, helping young people to have new opportunities by giving them uh, many formation for them to be able to have uh, more job opportunity and for them also to contribute in the, all the, the, the activities uh, that will be developed here in the, in the domain of infrastructure. The vocational training offered in this institution seeks to ensure knowledge transfer, technical capacity building and competent human capital in the country. Bring down gender-based violence and uphold the education of the girl child for the edification of a gender-free society. That was Cameroon's Minister of Women's Empowerment and the Family, Marie Teresa Benondwa, addressing her collaborators as she opened the annual conference of her ministry in Yaoundé today. Discussions at the annual event are running under the slogan, Optimizing Service Provision to Better Achieve the Objectives of the National Development Strategies. Larry Nane Pote reports. An annual encounter among officials of the Central and Devolved Services and Specialized Technical Units of the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and the Family to share experiences and jointly come up with an action plan for 2024 with the protection of the rights of women and the girl child and their family at the forefront. No child in Cameroon should be without a birth certificate. No child in Cameroon should be afraid to go home. No woman in Cameroon should be afraid to move around without being victim of some form of gender-based violence. Special emphasis was laid on feminicide, which has recorded many cases recently in the country. We should see an end to violence on women. We have been talking a lot about feminicides. We should see economic development. We need to empower our women and our families have to be stable. Our children should be in a safe environment. The goal this year is therefore to provide these women with income generating activities as defense mechanisms. Meantime, achieve the objectives of the National Development Strategy, NDS 30. In the meantime, the staff of the Ministry of Empl Employment and Vocational Training were today concluding the annual conference in Yaoundé with a New Year Wishes event during which they exchanged New Year tithings with their boss, Isachirama Bakari. Mr. Chiroma challenged his collaborators to show proof of diligence and serenity and ensure that 2024 targets of the ministry are attained. Details with Larry's Nane Epote once again. One after the other, the personnel of the Central and Devolved Services of the Ministry of Employment and Vocational Training shake hands with Minister Isa Churuma Bakari, re echoing the traditional Happy New Year, Mr. Minister, wishing him good health and wisdom to smoothly carry out the duties conferred on him, an occasion he uses to congratulate the personnel of his ministry 
why encouraging them to work towards empowering youths in professional and vocational training centers across the country to make the import substitution policy a reality in Cameroon. Long serving personnel are equally decorated with medals by the minister and retired staff giving incentives for a job well done while in active service. Many people don't attend this level of work for 39 years of service to the state. And I want to appreciate President Paul Bia and the, the ministers to help me to have achieved all this. The ministry is looking forward to continue transforming home economic centers into vocational training centers across the national territory in 2024. The 108th Cultural Festival of the Batanga people in the south of Cameroon is off and running in Kribi. The festival that commemorates the return of the Batanga tribesmen to their land after fleeing to Victoria for safety during the First World War avails the Batanga people in Kribi an opportunity to revisit their history, strengthen bonds with other communities while celebrating what makes them unique. Bruno Ndongwe Funwe is in Kribi. With a strong attachment to their history, the Batanga people of the South region remind themselves of their homecoming back for an occupancy of their land after fleeing what might have been a mass exodus of their tribe during the First World War. A simulation of their return from the Den Victoria through the ocean dressed in leaves, carrying only the belongings fit for a distance journey was done. The 108th February Cultural Festival, celebrated this February 14, was an opportune moment to remind the people of the history. This festival has taken another dimension. It's an opportunity for our population to set to sell himself or to make people know what is really a Batanga. The Batanga February Cultural Festival, which acknowledges the first phase of returnees from Victoria, helped natives embrace their culture even better. It's been amazing really to witness this kind of cultural uh, jamboree. Cultural activities from dances, traditional wrestling and canoe racing, which are rooted part of the Batanga culture, were performed and winners rightfully are rewarded. The chiefs walked to the ocean and thanked her for being generous and protective over the Batanga people over the past century. And that's it for me for the week and for today. I'll be back with you again on Monday and until then... Thanks for the privilege of your company and many, many, many thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.